one politician who hasn't been afraid to speak out against police brutality is Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. Her career began on the national level when she was elected as the first African-American woman to represent Georgia in Congress in 1992, earning a reputation as an anti-war hawk and champion of human rights. She went on to serve 12 years in Congress and most recently ran for president on the Green Party ticket in 2008. Congresswoman McKinney joins me now to discuss the public's growing discontent with the police. Thank you so much for coming on, Cynthia. Always a pleasure. Thank you for asking me on, Abby. So do you think the relationship between citizens and police has gotten significantly worse from previous generations? And how much do you think these killings have to do with race or class? Well, in some communities, the, there has always been tension. And of course, if we go back to the 1960s, we can remember that the creation, the impetus for the creation of the Black Panther Party was around the issue of police brutality. And I grew up with a policeman as a police officer, as my father, and I remember he would come home and he would complain all the time about the um, police officers handcuffing black pe members of the black community to telephone poles and beating them with their nightsticks. So um, some communities have been on the front line, but now we have more and more communities in the United States that are on the front lines because one, we have not dealt with the homeless problem. We have not dealt very responsibly with mental illness as in your monologue, which is so sad. And um, then of course we still haven't dealt with race and class. Mm -hmm. So if we have so many unattended to issues and you give people who are poorly trained or um, their attitudes uh, are such that they don't live in the community that they police and therefore um, they don't know the community and they don't know the members of the community, um, then you get the kind of attitudes that result in un unparalleled levels of police terror is what we call it. In fact, we just formed an organization to which I'm the co-chair, the National Coalition to Combat Police Terror. It is so many systemic issues. You're definitely right about that. It's really hard to pinpoint. But I mean, if it, you know, it's so hard to say a solution, right? Because there's so many roots of this. But I mean, if you could point to one that we can maybe direct our our energy to right now, would it be ending the 1033 program? Would it be reforming the grand jury process? What do you think? Well. I think probably first and foremost that community policing ought to really be about the community. And um, as we said last night in our town hall meeting, that we've got to put the neighbor back into neighborhood and community back into policing. So therefore, we need police officers who actually police the communities that they live in. And this is something that has been fought by police unions, but it's an idea that's long overdue. And we really need to implement that. Once we have the real sense of community policing, and then I think attitudes will change. But right now, we have a lot of police officers who have no relationship other than a paycheck to the communities that they're charged to serve. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if there's no, um, if there's no, no empathy on the part of the police officer, then of course they've got all these militarized weapons and they intend to use them and it's easy for them to be used. Yeah, and then they're training and, you know, next to Israeli troops, Bahraini troops, and then coming in, all these contingents of officers coming in to just react to one protest that are just from different communities. It's insane. It's pure insanity. Uh, you know, this is really fascinating because during the height of the Ferguson protests, some of the media were comparing the militarized policing going on in Gaza to what happened in Ferguson. And I know that there was some activists in Ferguson who actually went there to show solidarity with Palestine. As someone who, you know, you've been obviously active in both movements, what do you think they can learn about each other? Well, clearly um, there's some parallels. And in fact, many people have drawn the uh, comparisons of police occupation versus the occupation um, uh, by the Israelis in Palestine. And that came, became very clear 
with the Ferguson protest. I was involved in a protest just yesterday morning. I was in Cobb County, Georgia at the Weather Channel and I was uh, protesting along with other activists who are concerned about what is being sprayed in our air um, with the chemtrails or geoengineering as it's called. And if you can imagine, there are probably two dozen of us out there protesting with the big billboards and everything. And the police presence was incredible. Now, of course, because we were in suburban Atlanta um, and I was the only black protester, um, the, the attitude of the police was palpably different. I have been in those protests where the police were not friendly and they did not wave at us, but in fact, they were threatening to us. But yesterday was a demonstration to me that the attitudes are quite different when the police share something in common, even with the protesters. Yeah, and how amazing is it that, you know, people think that this is kind of a, an American issue, but I mean, even people in Gaza who are going through hell on a daily basis, we're putting up signs saying, you know, we show solidarity for Ferguson. I mean, it's just it's an incredible solidarity movement internationally. And I know that you, you've been to Palestine. You also went to Syria with Ramsey Clark. That's you know, we have about a minute left, but I just wanted to see what you found there that surprised you. Well, you know, what I found in Gaza was the indomitable human spirit. And I think that's what we're seeing here in the United States. The one thing, though, that I would caution against is that we cannot allow this rising spirit in the U.S. to be co-opted by either of the political parties with status quo candidates and status quo policies. We have got, we're on the precipice of change, and we need to complete the change that the people are calling for. Well, you've definitely never been able to be co-opted by either of the parties. Cynthia McKinney, that's why I love you. Thank you so much for coming on today and for your insight as always. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching, you guys. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Abby Martin. Join me tomorrow when I break the set all over again.